Native Americans were the earliest residents along the shores of the Colorado River. Semi-nomadic Mojaves built their homes from the materials they found in their environment. They wove baskets and made earthenware pottery from native clays and soils. They raised corn, beans, wheat, squash, and melons. They raised turkeys and tamed wild dogs for pets and hunting companions. The Chimuaves migrated from the north. Hunter-gatherers, they worked with buckskin and produced fine willow baskets from the river's reeds. As white men migrated west, life for the Mojaves and Chimuaves changed forever. In 1859, the U.S. Army established a reservation near Parker. The Colorado River Indian Tribes Reservation, or CRIT, today is the homeland of Hopi and Navajo peoples as well. The Chimuaves also occupied 36,000 acres directly across from Lake Havasu in California. The blue waters of Lake Havasu drive our thriving tourism industry today. But a hundred years ago, miners flocked to what would become Lake Havasu City in search of silver, gold, lead, copper, and graphite. As early as 1890, gold was being harvested from Crossman Peak. Active mining operations continued into the 1930s, and even today, modern-day prospectors sift the sands and rocks, modern-day metal detectors replacing pickaxes and shovels. At about the time that mining was winding down, a new pot of gold was about to be built along the Colorado River. Booming Southern California needed water. The mighty Colorado River had plenty. The solution was a huge reservoir. What would become Parker Dam had its beginnings in 1931. A.E. Bud Graham began surveying a location for the dam north of Parker. In 1938, the dam was finished and Lake Havasu was born. Within four years, water was flowing to Southern California for agriculture in the Imperial Valley and for the growing communities of Los Angeles and San Diego. Drivers along Highway 95 can see what appear to be giant straws dipping into the lake from the western cliffside. The Witsit pumping station draws thousands of gallons an hour up through more than 300 feet of pipes. Water eventually arrives at Lake Matthews near Riverside, California for delivery to LA and San Diego. In 1985, the Southern Arizona Project provided precious water to thirsty Phoenix and Tucson. And on the southern end of the lake, the Parker Power Plant houses four hydroelectric generators. Water leaving Parker Dam turns the dynamos that power the Witsit pumping station and the surrounding communities. The modern history of Lake Havasu City actually began on what is now the island. World War II opened the first chapter in the story of Lake Havasu City. As America's war machine accelerated, mining in the Chimuevi Mountains was halted. The area converted to a gunnery range for the Army Air Force. One of several emergency landing fields along the river was built on what is now the island, along with a rest and convalescence camp, still called Site 6 to this day. Thousands of soldiers enjoyed the facilities during the war. At war's end, Vic and Corrine Spratt converted Site 6 to a fishing camp. Many GIs with fond memories of the area returned to visit the area's pioneer resort. A chance flyby changed the area from a remote, sleepy desert shoreline to what now is a fast-growing metropolitan area. In 1958, industrialist Robert McCulloch was in the hunt for a testing facility for his outboard motor company. Flying over, McCulloch spotted Site 6, landed, and within three days struck a deal to buy the surrounding land for $300,000. In 1959, McCulloch hit upon a plan to move his manufacturing facilities from expensive Southern California and create a new community, Lake Havasu City. Engineer and colleague C.V. Wood was a bit skeptical at first, creating a town out of raw desert. It seemed far-fetched to Wood at first, but as he crunched the numbers, it began to make sense. Wood, one of the geniuses that helped create Disneyland, put his design expertise to work on McCulloch's dream. By 1964, what we would recognize as Lake Havasu City began to take shape. Two years later, a thousand people called Lake Havasu City home. Fifty miles of pavement was down and utilities were in place. The first school in 1964. A year later, the first church. Also by 66, McCulloch had established his own airline, a fleet of planes to bring prospective buyers to this burgeoning oasis in the desert. More than 130,000 people flew in for a look. Many bought home sites to relocate or for future retirement homes. Where people come, business follows. Shops, offices, medical facilities sprouted up in the McCulloch Boulevard corridor. And that was just the beginning. The relocation of McCulloch's chainsaw manufacturing plant to Lake Havasu brought good paying jobs and job seekers. Other plants and employers followed McCulloch. 
At one point, McCulloch developed a gyroplane, hoping to create a market for personal aircraft, one of the few dreams that went unrealized. As word spread, homes began to creep ever further into the foothills and beyond. But McCulloch wasn't satisfied to create a new community from raw desert. By 1968, he was looking for an icon, a centerpiece to his creation. On a trip to New York City, C.V. Wood learned that the London Bridge was for sale. The 130-year-old span was falling victim to modern traffic demands. What was an architectural wonder in the 1830s was antiquated and obsolete in the bustle of 1960s London traffic. Modern loads were literally driving the bridge into the mud of the Thames River. March 23, 1968, Robert McCulloch bought the bridge for $2.4 million. By July 4th, the first of hundreds of carefully marked and coated granite blocks arrived in Long Beach, California. July 9th, the first of the stones arrived in Lake Havasu at the base of the Pittsburgh Peninsula. Late that same year, the cornerstone was laid in ceremonies attended by the Lord Mayor of London, Sir Gilbert Inglefield. Work began in earnest to give birth to the new London Bridge. 33,000 tons of blocks were carefully fitted together, using the desert itself to provide a construction platform. Then later, two million cubic yards of earth were removed to create a bed for the soon-to-become Bridgewater Channel. By 1971, the work was done. The London Bridge was now at home in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Millions of people have visited this transplanted landmark. Tens of thousands have made Lake Havasu City their home, too.